Well, hello and welcome once again to our presentation and our webinar, Building the AI-Enabled Strategy. Uh, very excited to present this today. It's such a hot topic for us among QA professionals and uh, have a great panel here for you today as well. Uh, we'd like to do some introductions just very uh, uh, right away here. Um, first of all, here's our agenda for today. So we want to do a quick overview of artificial intelligence and machine learning and particularly the impact it has on QA and testing. Uh, we'll talk about how AI won't replace human testers, uh, but what it does is it allows us to focus on the more human-centric things, the things that uh, us as human beings should be spending more time with. Uh, we'll talk about the strategy involved with creating the right blend of AI speed and coverage uh, with human creativity. So we feel that there's a, just a real fine point, there's a good midpoint of where you can maximize the leverage technologies to really maximize the human human brain and uh, ultimately lead to the best outcomes possible for QA organizations. And then uh, we'll also take a deeper dive into AppVance's leading AI technology uh, with some demonstrations and uh, take a, uh, you know, a real exciting look at this product and, and uh, you know, excited to share this with you because I think you'll be real uh, impressed with what you see. So, and then of course, at the end of the day, we'll do, or at the end of the presentation, we'll do an open discussion and a Q&A section as well. Uh, with that, uh, just a real quick uh, introduction. Uh, I, I'll introduce uh, myself. I'm Kirk Walton, uh, Vice President at TAP QA. Uh, and I'm joined today with uh, two, uh, two of my, my close friends and colleagues, Mike and Colin. Mike, uh, if you'd introduce yourself, or both of you would introduce yourself. Absolutely. My name is Mike Wagner. I'm the test architect here at TAP QA. Uh, really excited to be a part of the session today. Hi, I'm Colin Sullivan. I'm a delivery manager at, at TAP QA. Same for me. Great. Uh, and then uh, with that, uh, also excited to introduce Kevin Serace. Kevin is the CTO and chairman of Advance. Uh, a lot of you are probably very familiar with Kevin, having seen him speak at conferences all over the world. Uh, Kevin is one of the best speakers I've ever met in the, uh, the field of AI, and particularly as it pertains to testing. And uh, with that, Kevin, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to you for a further introduction. Well, uh, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks, thanks for having me. Uh, this is fun. I'm, I, we're all, most of us are at home. I'm coming to you from the bridge of the enterprise. Uh, fortunately, because of this uh, fantastic background, you can put in Zoom these days. So let's, I'm just going to open a little bit in AI software testing. I'm going to do some demos later and get into some more uh, uh, sort of technical uh, uh, overview and, uh, and be happy to answer a lot of technical questions. Uh, uh, finding bugs autonomously, that's sort of our job in the end, but what bugs and which ones are important and which ones are important to the users of software, uh, and, and we have to do this. Um, part of the reason we have to do this is that our software is getting more complex and uh, there's simply not enough humans in the world to simply manually test everything or even write enough scripts to get high coverage. This is all, always interesting to me. The worldwide spend on software testing today is about $120 billion. 98% of that spend is on people, 2% on technology. Now, if you looked at security in your network systems or network operations, you would find the flip side of this. 90-something percent is spent on technology and a small percent is, is spent on people. And that's not to say that these people aren't amazing and important and everything else. It just says that this is one of the last areas where we haven't uh, had the right technology to actually help our people advance and empower our people. And that's why we just haven't seen uh, a, 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 a lot of spend. Now, one could use AI and QA to do a lot of different things. We could recognize objects better. We do that. It's very cool. It's all good stuff, right? Help pinpoint the cause of errors. Self-heal scripts. It's always a good idea. Um, automatically generate tests and, and find bugs. We felt that overall we had to deliver to the industry something that would reduce QA time and increase productivity and efficiency and again sort of empower the teams that are already in place. So if they've got this much coverage today, can we use technology to get that much coverage tomorrow doing no more work than we're doing today, but maybe some different work than, 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 than you've ever done. We were able some years ago to actually spend some time and measure where people spend their time. And if you look across the industry, most of the time, first of all, it's just spent on manual testing. That may not be the same in your 
organization, but across the industry, about 70% tests are manual. So no surprise about the chart on the right. Then the rest is spent writing scripts, then fixing scripts, and actually very little time is left in your teams to sort of just run the test. You don't spend a lot of time running tests, they run themselves. But analyzing tests and producing great data and thinking about how these tests matter to the humans who are going to use the product and how you can make the product better so that maybe it's more testable and more usable. That's where everybody should be spending their time and we don't have the time because we're so busy manual testing and writing scripts. And also, we've got poor code coverage today. If you've ever bothered to measure your code coverage, you're happy maybe with your test coverage. You may be happy with other things, but, but code coverage is often we see under 10% even with hundreds and hundreds of scripts that you're maintaining, which is burying the team. It's really fascinating. So we, we, obviously our goal is 100% code coverage, right? So um, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, improvement we can have. And lastly, I wanna just talk quickly uh, about the five levels of a test to autonomy. Now, uh, uh, five levels of autonomy exist in every field today, in every AI field that exists in, in uh, driverless vehicles. So we didn't invent this chart. The chart's been around, I don't know, maybe four years or so. Most of you on this webinar are probably at level zero and level one. There's no automation or there's some automation with scripting and coding. And you're very proud of what you achieved. This chart just shows you how much further you can go, even today with technology we already have, uh, to get to auto-generated smart scripts with validations. It's what's called hands-off, minds-off. It's true in every industry, right? This would be true in RPA. It's true in driverless vehicles. It's true in robots. Once we're hands-off, minds-off, we've done some really unique setup, but we can let the machine do what it does. And, and we know the confines of what it does it, and how it does it, and we can leave that alone. So we all want to get to level five. Yes, you can get to level five today. And I bet there's no one on this call, no one on this webinar watching it now or later, who would argue with me if I said in 10 years, AI is going to test all our software. It'll test 99% of what we need to test sort of by itself with some human setup. What's surprising to people is that you can do most of that today. It's been available for more than three years. It continues to mature. And that's some of what we'll talk about today. This is a measure of productivity. It's, it's based on a bunch of uh, uh, models of how humans work. And, and, you know, at level zero, level one, level two, level three, you'll see on the chart on the right, it barely moves. Yes, you get 10% or 20% more, more productivity. But if you want to get incredible productivity gains, you've got to get to level four and level five on the autonomy scale. It's just, that's what's required. And again, level five is AI generates tests automatically. It executes validations automatically. 5,000 tests in under an hour, very, you know, sort of things that you can measure, right? And no, that isn't a fallacy and no, isn't a dream. But there's a whole set of setup that is really, really critical for humans to be involved in. So yes, this machine's amazing, but it's only as good as you've taught it to be. And you're gonna hear that theme a little bit with AI today, right? Our AI is not as smart as you think. With that, I'm gonna turn it back over to the uh, TAP QAP. Kirk, you're muted. I knew I was gonna do that, so no thanks, That's Kevin, okay. I, I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I mean, like you said, I mean, the, the it's profound how much artificial intelligence and machine learning can impact software testing. Uh, you, you're gonna be able to do significantly more with, with less effort. I mean, the, the speed in which uh, AIQ can produce end-to-end -end tests is just, you know, far, it far surpasses anything that, that humans can do. But what, what we see is, uh, you know, AI, like Kevin said, it's, it's really, it's only as, um, you know, as, as smart as, as you train it to be. Uh, I look at, at AI and it's, you know, it's kind of like, it, it's like a baby. Well, and I went too far. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, while it's changing the world, it, it still starts out in, uh, you know, in an infant phase. And uh, as you know, with, with babies, I mean, they, you know, as cute as they are, they, there's just not a lot of, brain, there's not a lot they can do until you teach them to do something. Uh, same is true with AI tools. I mean, it's very singular, singularly focused. Uh, and until it has the data set or the training in which uh, it's going to do something, it's, it's still, at the end of the day, it's, it's still stupid, as, as, as uh, ironic as it is to say that about artificial intelligence. Um, I mean, like I said, they need to be taught. Um, I, I, I bring up uh, AlphaZero, and I don't know if, if you're familiar with AlphaZero. Feel free to raise your hand in the chat room if, you, if you've heard of AlphaZero. 
Um, what it is, it's a, it's, a, it's a program that was put together by DeepMind. And the idea was to be the, uh, the number one system in the world or just be any other system that's ever been made uh, when it comes to chess and another game Go. Um, and within 24 hours, just with the computational power that AlphaZero had, uh, it became the number one chess system. It beat any other chess system that had ever been created. In fact, by, you know, by, mag by magnitudes, it was already better. It had the highest ELO score uh, ever recorded. And the way it did that is it pit AlphaZero against each other. So it just went over scenario and scenario and scenario at, at, at just breakneck speed to the point where it came up with an algorithm that could just defeat anything. Uh, and basically think about the billions of computations or the billions of moves you can make with chess. The thing about AlphaZero though, it became really good at chess because you taught it to play chess. Now, if you put AlphaZero in another scenario, say football, uh, you can't just drop in uh, AlphaZero as this omniscient being to, uh, to become the, the best football strategist of all time. And, and the difference between chess and football, of course, I mean, you know, chess is all strategy, but it's also a very black and white game. With things like football and other activities and other um, you know, scenarios, there's, there's obviously a big gray area. Uh, with football, it's you know, the players on your team, the players on the other team, the conditions of the game, the abilities that your quarterback and your offensive skill players have. And those can vary even within a game, just based on injuries and fatigue and things like that. So it's a very you know, gray area as opposed to chess being, you know, in most cases, very black and white. And I think that's a good rule of thumb with AI. Uh, the more black and white, or the more um, you know, the more you can pit a test case uh, on on logic, the more AI is going to be able to help you. But there's just so much there in the gray area for QA professionals that uh, AI, while it can, while it's going to be able to test the majority of test cases, I mean, there's going to be those. Uh, those small percentage test cases that really, in a lot of cases, make or break the success of a, of a product release. Um, so we, we kind of caveat this slide with AI, has an incre AI is going to have an incredible impact, but as long as it's trained the right way. So as we kind of sum things up, and, and really, you know, again, I think, um, you know, some of the uh, concerns that maybe QA professionals have had, and we, we hear this at all the conferences we go to since AI has really been a hot topic over the last few years, is are, are QA testers or human testers in danger because of AI? And we say no, AI is here to really enhance and empower the QA profession as long as we have our focus in the things that are most important for humans to focus on. Um, first of which is just domain and application knowledge. It's just knowing exactly you know what the application is supposed to do or putting yourselves in the shoes of the end user we talk about empathy that is such a critical component of quality assurance that you are really focused on end user satisfaction as opposed to just does this work uh if you're familiar at all with the world quality report I mean, feel free again to raise your hand in the chat room if uh, it's something that you're you're familiar with um for the last couple of years, end user satisfaction has been the number one, voted at least as the number one most important uh, component of a QA organization. And uh, it's, it's something where the focus now for QA professionals really has to be on not just does this work, but is this going to, uh, is this product going to be adopted by my, my customer base? Is it going to be adopted by my end users? And these are all things that humans can really focus on if we take the really tedious black and white tasks of testing off of our plates, which is something that AI technologies are, are going to do in, in remarkable ways. So with that, uh, we want to talk about creating that AI-enabled strategy, finding that good blend between leveraging technology and pointing the humans in the right position to, or the right focus, or giving them the right focus to really, really maximize their impact in a QA organization. And with that, uh, Mike, our test architect, uh, Mike Wagner, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Kirk. Yeah, as we look to really create an, an AI-enabled testing strategy, it's really important that we really take our tests and we break them into two separate buckets. So we have our AI candidates and our non-AI candidates. And really what our non-AI candidates are is really the human testing aspect, right? So these, this includes like mission critical tests that we need for the future that is act, that's currently in our sprint, right? 
So we have required tests and scripts that we need to validate this feature with. And really the AI candidate side is the other, um, is really the peripheral testing around that, uh, that mission critical testing that, that's being done. And it's really boosting that code coverage behind uh, the, and supporting the testers in, in uh, fact. So a couple examples here would be like we were, if, uh, of human testers would be using, uh, creating user stories. So, uh, for the technologies here, we have the test designer with ML assisted, right? And on the AI side, we have some uh, massively increased code coverage, right? So we, we have the AI and ML created for the AI technology being used here. So I wanna give a couple more examples of the non-AI candidates here on the next slide, yep. Oop, go back one more, there you go. All right, so yeah, so a couple examples of some non-AI candidates. This is where the human testers are performing the test. It's really our apathetic testing, right? So we have our UAT testing, our persona testing, and really want to uh, emphasize like our ad hoc testing, right? This is where it really requires creativity and domain knowledge from the user to be able to create those tests. On the other hand, we have our, in our AI candidates, we have a couple examples, which is the code coverage that we talked about, right? Where we're covering that peripheral testing that's, that's being done, but also uh, highlighting areas in our, in our application where we have high maintenance areas, right? So like defining our web elements, uh, improving the, the uh, creation time of our test cases uh, and really moving forward with that. And by doing so, we're really empowering our testers and giving them uh, more time to, be, to actually specialize on what they're doing. So what I mean by that is basically um, in the old model that, or the current model that's being currently used is basically we have our, we get our feature that we're gonna be testing uh, and all of our testers pile onto that feature during the sprint and within that time frame and they try to test everything they possibly can within that time frame. And the reality is, is that that time frame might be perfect for testing those mission critical tasks and making sure that feature is um, ready to go for production. However, there's that peripheral testing is being missed, right? So we have a lot of inconsistent uh, code coverage that's happening in the backside. With a more efficient model that utilizes AI technologies on the back end, we're really freeing up the tester to be able to not have to uh, to really focus in on their strengths and really focus in on their specializations, right? So we might have a tester that's really good at creating test cases or re really good at creating documentation or writing tests for APIs. Uh, and they can really focus in on that. And it, I think it's a more of a culture and QA mind shift where they, they're able to really uh, improve on what they can do and then allow the workload to be handled by the, the AI technology on the, on the back end. So I think that uh, that inf er, emphasis on QA mindset is really important. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Colin. And yeah, thanks, Mike. So uh, what we're getting at here is, um, like, like Mike is saying, it's a big mind shift away from kind of the status quo. Uh, and we're looking at, uh, you know, quality and testing and all of the other facets of our jobs that this AI adoption can open up for you. Uh, so, you know, you're, as people have been saying so far, the limiting resource in testing efforts is always, you know, human capacity, right? How much attention can we pay? How much time do we have to spend? Uh, how much, you know, we make our plans and then we need to execute them. Uh, you know, the, you're, you're with an AI technology backing you, you are able to kind of uh, push all of that execution to your AI and your QAs can focus on those other aspects of your work. Like, like we've been saying, uh, you're looking able to actually focus on end user satisfaction. Uh, and then what we're really getting to is what we like to call humanual testing. And uh, it, humanual testing is, it's kind of a, a uh, an effort we're making on, you know, empathy-based testing and human-centric testing. Uh, this is something we rolled out to a lot of our testers uh, at TAPQA, uh, and it's, um, we're finding some great success on a, a lot of our projects that are using it. Um, so you're establishing your empathy with your user bases. Uh, you can get surveys, interviews, and uh, passive analytics data, anything like that, that you can use to gain those insights into your users and how they're gonna use your products. 
Uh, so it's a big shift left that we've all been hearing about uh, for QA. Uh, in, it's empowering your testers or your QAs uh, so they can focus on total, total product quality rather than just that activity of testing that takes up all their time. Uh, and then the big benefit here is through leveraging that AI, you, you aren't gonna slow down and you're not gonna sacrifice your coverage. Your AI can just, uh, you're effectively getting your executions for free uh, compared to that human capacity that you're always measuring and uh, feeling like you're being bottlenecked by. Uh, design thinking is another big aspect of this. This is another thing that we've rolled out uh, throughout, throughout a, a lot of our projects at TAPQA. Uh, typically this is, uh, for those of you that aren't familiar, typically this is something that's seen you know, very early in projects, uh, kind of the, the realm of your designers or your UX folks. Uh, but with some, uh, some tweaks and kind of framing it with some quality uh, considerations in mind, uh, it can be a really powerful problem-solving methodology for your QAs and testers to employ uh, in solving some of those wicked problems that you're going to be faced with. Uh, you know, as Kirk said before, you're you're kind of taking away a lot of that black and white uh, decision making that is easy, and you're actually able to focus on complex and difficult things that need that human attention. And then as far as implementing this, uh, some of these ideas go, uh, it's, it's challenging. It's going to be hard. It's a, it's a big difference to the way things are done uh, now and in the past. Uh, it's, a, it's a definite journey that you're never going to really stop. You're going to continue, uh, continue moving forward and you're getting away from that focus, that human focus on just functional, 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 and you're getting to usability and uh, overall quality a lot faster. And it's gonna let your people have a lot bigger impact on your projects and on your users. And then we're gonna head back over to Kevin and kind of get into a deeper dive here of uh, AppVance's offering. All right, uh, welcome back as they say. Well, really, uh, really fun and that's a great uh, setup for what we're going to talk about here, which is really a new way to think about how we test, a new way to think about how we build our applications uh, uh, for our audience. Um, because in, in the end, that is QA's job. <clears throat> um, you can, I, there's a lot I won't cover today, but if you really enjoy the technology, uh, we have a slew of patents in this area over the last uh, four or five years or so. Absolutely encourage you to read them. Some of them are like 300 pages, so it's a big read. I want to talk about two areas today. Um, codeless test generation, um, that's about 20x faster than traditional scripting. It's ML assisted. You're going to like that. And then AI test generation, where the machine generates tests all by itself with some setup. We'll talk about that. That's literally measurable at 100,000 times faster than scripting, uh, but, but has its field of use, right? So again, kind of specific use cases up above, using machine learning to reduce maintenance, and then code coverage and autonomous bug finding down below, using ML to locate bugs by itself. That's that set of sort of cloud system that you see there. Now, this is not AppVance. I'm just going to baseline here because I want to jump forward with this exact same application and, and scripting. So here, we're scripting a very traditional uh, model. It's uh, something that you're probably very familiar with here. We're in Eclipse. That's Java. Very straightforward. All we're writing is a simple 16-step script. And that 16-step script takes us about 20 minutes and 41 seconds to write this particular uh, script writer. is actually quite fast. Um, and we're going back and forth between Chrome Dev Mode to find the accessors that, that we want to use. And we're using our human brain power to pick what we think is, is right, whether it's right or wrong. But we've got 20 minutes as a baseline. Now, we have yet to data drive that. We haven't put conditionals in. It's a very straightforward script. But what I want to do is 
replicate that exact same script. Now, this is ML assisted, okay? It isn't full AI yet. We'll see that in a moment. <clears throat> but this is the same application, and I'm writing the same 16 steps. In fact, we're on step seven. You can see step eight now on the left, right? So you see the steps coming up as I'm using the application. Now, what's great about this technology is it is compatible with all the modern libraries, and we'll talk about why that is and, and, and sort of how this works behind the scenes. And if there's any limitations, I don't think there are. The goal of this was to reduce maintenance by 80% for those specific use cases that you feel are absolutely critical. You're not gonna wait for a machine to maybe generate it. It might, it might not. It's, this isn't about coverage. This is about specific use cases. You'll see I'm done. This is a fully editable uh, a script, by the way. You can do anything you want to. It's a full language. It's called a designer script. There's the 16 steps. The same 16 steps were created in 64 seconds. It is literally the same steps as the other script that we saw that took 20 minutes. I was just able to do it in 64 seconds. Well, that's good. Not only was I able to do it in 64 seconds, this type of script technology, because it's ML assisted now, reduces maintenance by about 80%. And it doesn't just work on demo sites like that. You know, here's the Apple uh, um, store, which has uh, Angular and, and iframes, works great with iframes, no, no, no problem and other things. So, so sort of what's legacy versus this sort of test designer thing? Well, we've been writing scripts and we know uh, how long it, how many seconds it took to write that same script and take 64 seconds here and that, and by the way, we've been measuring this for uh, many, many, many years. So on average, it does run about 20 times faster than traditional scripting, but more than that, more maintainable, which we'll talk about in a second. Now, I want to give a quick demo of AI test generation. This is where a machine, after some very specific and thoughtful and trained people have set it up properly, don't want to underestimate that, okay? After they have done that, and for us, that's TapQA. TapQA is one of our partners who does this. Um, they get it set up thoughtfully uh, with, with uh, all regard to what you're trying to achieve for your users and for your CIO and everything in between. And once that's set up, now I can tell the machine to go generate some scripts. In this case, I'm gonna generate only a few. I click Generate Scripts, and I'm done. In 1.4 seconds, we generated 183 scripts, but 27 unique use cases that I care about. So you'll see scripts created that I wanna keep are 27. And what's interesting about that is I can simply open up any of these scripts that were machine generated, and I'm gonna open one here. This is one of them. It's 39 steps, it's also a designer script. I could also open it in JS, pure JS, so I can have a JavaScript if I, if I want as well. It's already data-driven for me. Those fields have been mapped previously in the setup. So 27 of these kinds of scripts, this happens to be 39 steps, they, they vary in, in, in length, have been generated automatically by a machine in 1.4 seconds. In 1.4 seconds. Now, you'll have a lot of questions about that. I'm just gonna note that this works for mobile as well. So mobile native applications, web applications, web view, React, uh, et cetera. So, so that literally is 100,000 times faster. It's not a marketing term. We've been measuring this for the last three years or so. Yes, of course, the machine generates scripts quickly. But it turns out that generating scripts is not the best use of human time or human intellect. In fact, it's an awful use of your time. It's just that's what we've had to do because those are the only tools that that, that we had. So I'm gonna talk about how this works now. Now, now the technology behind this, uh, first of all, there's about between four and five million lines of code today. So this is a very big code base, by the way. It's not a tool, it's truly a platform. It might be the largest code base in test automation history. Um, it's pure JavaScript. So it eliminates legacy scripting limitations. We don't have a limitation that keeps us from seeing everything. We can see everything because we live in there with everything, right? So it uses a JS injection only on the browser under test in the case of a browser in this case, and allows us to interact with all of the different libraries and um, we can see the entire stack from UX to server responses works in every browser. Very cool. Now let's talk about how we use ML in, 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 in test designer to reduce maintenance. The first is accessor prioritization, including image recognition. So we can, we can recognize about 21 different accessors and choose those based on a whole set of algorithms, including your own, that is a QA engineer's weighting of certain 
accessors. So it'll use those in priority. The second is it will then go and learn the best accessor within that build by actually repeating the process, actually running the script five times right in front of you. Now I'm not going to, you see, you see the different accessors that are here and we'll just select optimize script. I'm not going to run all of these optimize script in Chrome and off it goes. This is sped up a little bit just to get through it. I won't run all of these, but you can see the script running. You actually see it step by step going through its thing. And what's doing is the machine is keeping track of every possible accessor for every possible one of these elements or, or, or line items. And it's actually changing the script live. It's literally rewriting the script based on the weightings that it's seeing for stable accessors, which is really cool. And when we jump out of this, um, you will see, let me go over here, uh, you'll see some of these uh, have changed. And um, so now there's different uh, ones available. I'm gonna go ahead and store this after. You see step two and step three here, uh, they're using a text box username, password, password, and the old one had XPaths there. We obviously weight XPath at the lowest level because that is the least stable between builds. So that's an example of how we're using the machine right there. Here's another example uh, where we use something called accessor fallback. So we've built automatically an object repository of possible accessors on each subsequent build and each subsequent successful run. So if one isn't there, we will fall back to the others that we've put in the library automatically. You don't even know this is happening, right? It's automatic. And if none of that work, we can actually go and self-heal scripts by remembering all of those possible accessors, choosing the best one, uh, giving it to you and saying, would you like to rewrite that script? So that's how we're getting this sort of 80% maintenance reduction from accessor changes. There's a lot more in Test Designer, including automatic timing uh, and automatically waits for the next step to re-render, things like that. You can read these 10 items. I won't, I, I won't go through them, but it's very, very powerful uh, way to create those specific use cases that you still want to do. That's great. By the way, when you run UX tests, this is true in AI, as you'll see in a moment, you also get your API uh, results at the same time simultaneously, so you do see your API errors. Now, what happens if we want the machine to go and write scripts and test an application by itself? Sounds fanciful, sounds impossible. No, we launched it in 2017. It's been out about three years. Now, one of the mistakes people make, I think, is they approach me all the time and say, what is the AI algorithm that you use? Well, there's 19. We don't make it a secret. You can go read about them in the patents. Why are there 19? Why isn't there one big one? Because this isn't a single problem. It's actually myriad problems that we have to solve, just the way humans do. You know, humans look at a new page and go, hmm, I wonder if I should click that. Right? And then there's some knowledge that a human has, like a manual tester would have, that say, yes, this is something I want to do. So an example is I might not want to log out on page two. I might not want to log out till I'm done, whatever done means, right? So there's lots of these decisions that have to be made, and those are weighted in different ways using different algorithms. And look, AI, which is more of a marketing term than anything, I'd say augmented intelligence is probably a, a better way of thinking about it, um, it is nothing but math. I mean, all of machine learning is math and storing information and using that information to make the next decision. Whether that decision is a minute later, an hour later, a day later, a build layer, whatever the case is, it's all we're doing. We're waiting certain things, we're making a decision based on what we learned, we store that information, we use that in the future. That's all, it, and, and the machine can keep learning um, based on that. So that's what we do. I'm obviously not gonna walk through all those today. Now, this is a very, very critical portion of this. This is called human-assisted machine learning. And the truth is, pretty much all machine learning today, and certainly any that would be applied to a field such as ours in QA, software QA, absolutely requires this step. And the reason I can sit here and tell you no one else does this, period, no one else has automated script generation like this and hasn't, uh, one, because we have a lot of patents in it, so it'd be hard for them to do it. But the second reason is no one has this step. And, and you can't do it without this. You know, as, as Kirk said, Mike said, Colin said, you actually have to use humans to impart knowledge to the machine so that it doesn't do stupid things. I already mentioned one of them, which is don't log out on page two, page three, or page four, but don't log out till you're done. Whatever done means, we can define what done means. So we have a workbench to do this, and I will tell you it's not easy. It takes, it takes uh, real training and real experience. 
TapQA has this experience. And the, the point here is this is a recursive learning algorithm with human assisted machine learning, Hamel. Uh, and, and we call it AI hinting. And basically, the human is going to give particular hints to the AI engine that says, do this or don't do this. And there's a whole workbench of every single thing the machine could do, and some of those you're going to eliminate. And I'll give you an example. Do you really want to put something into a search box that jumps out to Google and searches the web? No, I do not want my testing to go out and uh, attempt to test the entire internet. That's a really bad idea. That's obvious when I tell you this. Here's another example. You have an e-commerce store, has 4.4 million pages because there's 4.4 million items. Do you really want to go to every page in the store and ultimately test the database? No, you actually don't want to test the store's database. You want to test the unique pages. Only you as a human actually know the unique pages. And you can identify what things to do and what things to not do over and over and over again. So we give you technology uh, to, to actually enable those kinds of things, what to do, what not to do, where to start, where to end, what to execute every time or sometimes or never or just on certain pages. Again, Lots and lots of experience to do this right. But once it's done, it's done up front, and it can take days, hours, sometimes weeks to get that right, depending on the complexity of the application, right? Whole different level of thinking around QA. And we got years of experience doing this on, I don't know, hundreds or thousands of applications now. So we, we really have a good uh, a, and a good great partnership with our model with our partners to do this for you, for, for customers. Now, after that, all that happens from a customer perspective is uh, we kick off a, a blueprint at each build. Now, you don't know what a blueprint is and then optionally find regression tests. So we're going to show you what a blueprint is now. So we have two sides of AI test generation. One is sort of a rough AI test generation, but it's really going to, it's going to get you essentially 100% code coverage or something very close to that. Step two is optional where we can refine those scripts. Let me talk about both of those. What is an AI blueprint? Well, a blueprint is, is a map. It's a mapping of an application. It's blueprinting the application. So the system is going to go and blueprint this new build. And every new build, it wants to go and learn what has changed, what's different, what's the same. <clears throat> As it does it, this is very cool. It already has inherited a component actions library that's, that's built up over the learnings it's had in the previous many, many years, right? It launches about 100 threads. Think of those as each individual robots. They're going to use those AI hints, that human-assisted machine learning that TapQA has done and put in there and test that and fill out forms. I've got to log in, I've got to have a password, et cetera, right? Now, what this system does is launch bot by bot by bot, essentially all in parallel, to start going down different pathways that are realistic user flows and their user flows based on the guideposts that we gave it in the AI hinting, but we don't know if anyone's ever taken that user flow, right? Remember, specific user flows, test designer, AI for coverage. So we don't know if anyone's ever taken it yet. We're just going to do them, and a user could take these user flows. So great. We're going to map every UI action to page to state to server requests. And in our wake, if you think of the little bot going along, right, along that little maze or those roads there, it takes a step. It records that step and in its wake writes a script to repeat that step. And the scripts that you're left with are sort of, uh, 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 you know, in arrears of what it did, if that makes sense. So it generates a few thousand use cases here, hundreds or thousands, but it's also already finished the testing. It, it actually wrote the use cases as it did the test. So the use cases are written behind it. And you're, you've got your AI generated functional test report with API errors, UX errors, JS errors, validation errors. We'll talk about those in, in a second. So there's no logs needed for this. It will figure out these flows generally by itself because they have to be practical user flows. <clears throat> now, here's an optional step, and this isn't required, but a lot of people like this. It's the only system in the world that will do this. We can take your standard production logs. We are not adding anything to your application whatsoever. Interrogate those logs automatically. They do exist in production, Splunk, Sumo Logic, W3C, and others. And remap them to what we saw in the blueprint. 
that we, we built in the blueprint, right? So in the blueprint, we've got these UI actions and groupings of API requests. We see similar groupings in the logs that are typically 40, 50 gigabytes, and we can uh, match those user re using a recursive best match algorithm, algorithm excuse me, called predator prey. You saw that on that other page of algorithms. If feed that to a code generator and automatically generate regression tests that are real regression tests. They really map to what your users have done in production and we've mapped them as closely as possible to the new build. That's mind blowing, but it works. It works amazingly well. That's at the UX level, even though we have no UX information, all we have is API information. So that gets mapped. The system writes 5,000 regression tests in under 10 minutes. So this is really, really fast. The system will run those all in parallel. So you can be done with those tests in five or 10 minutes, assuming your QA system can handle it. So that's a whole other ball of wax, as they say. So what's the comparison here? Is there a productivity improvement? Well, the best way to measure that is to say, what would I have to do to find the same bugs? What do I have to do in my workload today versus my workload with this technology? Well, my workload today to find this set of bugs, which is much larger than you're probably finding, is what? I'm going to write in this particular case at this customer about 200 critical user flows, traditional scripts, maybe that's two hours of script. You might be faster or slower depending on the application. And 2,000 additional scripts for coverage because typically your critical user flows have code coverage under 10% or under 15%. So you're gonna probably write another 2,000. Um, this is actually relatively close to real data from a client that we work with. Um, and so you can figure that out. That's about 5,000 human or 5,000 man hours or woman hours or whatever just to get it done. And then about 1,000 hours, 500,000 hours of maintenance at each build. That's a lot of work. That's what you do today to find this plethora of bugs. But on the right, if you were using this, this technology, which is now several years old, you'd still write those 200 critical user flows. You'd probably write them a lot faster because they can be written in test designer and there's a lot less maintenance, obviously, as we saw earlier. But the 2000 additional scripts for coverage can be generated after 12 or 24 or 40 hours of setup. Now there's real setup there. Don't underestimate that, the complexity, the thoughtfulness that goes into it. But after it's set up, it's about a 90% reduction in man hours. So what happens is what we've seen over the last three or four years is people end up taking their teams and spending them on creating better and more test data, um, analyzing the results because there's a lot more results to analyze. You might have 10 to 20 to 30 times more bugs than you've ever seen. Which ones are important? Which ones are important to your users? Learning from those user pathways, how users are actually using your software and how you might be able to improve that software, literally giving true QA feedback to, to, to dev, right? So um, that's what we're finding is people get, get um, relevated to a much higher level and much higher thinking, which is really, really cool. And this is the last thing, and this is a big area of empowering QA. <clears throat> we have an entire validation suite. I don't have time to go through it all today, but, but these validations will prove out any kind of logic or complexities that you want your application to do. There's data-driven validations, auto-validations, advanced validations, image recognition, OCR validations, and then complex validations like where to look, what to do when you see that, which could be any number of steps after it, and what's the pass or fail criteria. And then we have automatic built validations where it can go through the system, the machine will go through the application, learn what is appropriate, and then a human has to review those to say, was it working right? Is that what I want? And then use that against future builds. So there's so much you can do here. It's mind blowing. We'd love to give you that demo someday of more of this or go into, into more detail. But suffice it to say, what ends up happening, you start spending time on what is it I'm trying to validate? What is it that's important to my users? And it turns out that takes real thinking real user thinking, uh, as opposed to I'm sitting there writing the next script because uh, that's, you know, that's all the time I have, right? So it, it really empowers the QA teams in ways that I've never seen before. I'm so excited about it. 100% um, blueprint coverage of, of every action and unique page. Every action and every page will get covered. 100% um, uh, optional production user flow coverage. You can actually go back to your management and say, we know what our users are doing and we're testing for it, as opposed to what the BA said, the users are doing. This is what they're actually doing. About 90% less effort uh, uh, to, to achieve the same results, but you end up using that time to get better results. That's the real power of that. No maintenance because you redo this blueprint process um, at, every, um, uh, at every build. Um, so that's it.
empower your team. I'm going to hand it back to, uh, is it Kirk, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. Thank you, Kevin. Appreciate it. Um, and we'll, we'll open this up for Q&A right now. So if you have questions for Kevin or any of the members of the TAP QA team, uh, Mike Collin or myself, please enter those into the Q&A box. We have a few that are there already, so we'll, uh, we'll answer those. But want to wanna just, uh, you know, again, we're, we're so excited about the, the power of AI and, and what it will do for QA teams. And like, like Kevin said, I mean, there's, there's real human thinking that we – uh, you know, just don't have as much time that we to, to do as we'd like. Uh, really, the AI en enabled strategy is going to help with that. I mean, you have a powerful tool like AIQ to take off so many of the burdensome tasks of QA and really allow our professionals to focus on the things that uh, that we should be focusing on. So we'd love to talk to you more about that. Uh, you know, certainly a demonstration of AIQ that's customized for your environment. See how AIQ can really work with, uh, with your QA organization. Would love to be able to facilitate that with you and with the, the folks from AppVance. Uh, so feel free to reach, us, reach out to us for that. As you can see, uh, I, you have my email address as well as my Calendly link. It's something that'll uh, put an appointment directly on my calendar. Uh, we'll also talk about the AI strategy as well in figuring out what compartments to put what tests in. Uh, how do you get your folks trained up on design thinking or learning more about uh, empathetic based testing, human manual testing, like we, we call it, uh, and really just kind of finding that, that perfect blend of leveraging technology and maximizing human, human brain power for testing. Uh, we really feel that that is the, the approach to take with QA moving forward and uh, love to talk with you about how we can enable that strategy for your organization as well. Uh, so with that, we will go to the Q&A uh, and have quite a few questions uh, that we've seen during the course of the day. Um, uh, I'll start by just saying, uh, you know, and, and more about the product, Kevin, or, or start with this question. Do you have a, a trial version of the tool and do you provide assistance with learning? I mean, certainly the assistance with learning, that's something that Tap QA can help out with. Uh, but as far as like a trial version, Kevin, is that something that there, you have? There's no trial version um, because uh, the the type of experience that you need to get AI working on your behalf is the kind of experience that Tap QA brings, right? In fact, the uh, AI hinting and human assistant machine learning isn't something we even teach our clients today. It's something that our partners do for our clients. By the way, this is quite typical across the AI landscape. If we were talking about uh, robotic process automation from automation anywhere, they would do the same thing. Right, their partners set that up and take months to set it up. They don't teach clients to do it. It's it's in and, and and there's a whole set of reasons why that is. So that's why there's no uh, download free. You you would stare at it, not know what to do with it, and just be frustrated. Another question: uh, Is it able to do uh, service now or, or do testing around service now and the business flow of service now? Uh, yeah, I, I, actually, we've had many people uh, use this with ServiceNow. Everybody has, as you know, in ServiceNow, their own unique business flows. Um, it, the system doesn't really care. It'll, it, the test designer handles the specific flows that you want, and AI will pick up everything else and give you more coverage. It does work with ServiceNow. A question, and, and Kevin, you could probably best answer this as far as the entire AI landscape. Um, what's what's the adoption of AI technologies so far? Um, you know, obviously, it's something that's still very much an emerging thing. Uh, what have you seen, you know, across the landscape of all AI testing technologies, and just what the adoption has been so far? Well, first of all, we have to step back and say, what's the adoption of AI broadly in in the enterprise? Uh, virtually every enterprise has. Uh, you know, one, two dozens, I think uh, Volkswagen has something like 60 different AI trials going on or have implemented AI in a variety of ways. <clears throat> so almost every enterprise has lots and lots of AI happening in a lot of areas. Already using AI, for example, in, in, um, in security in their networks, right, obviously. So there's lots of places where we've seen deep penetration. Um, uh, today in the QA landscape, this is the only system, uh, there are a few systems that use a little bit of ML or, or AI to help with maintenance and, and things like that, um, but, or visual recognition. Uh, but, but this is the only system that generates scripts. I mean, it's truly AI-driven uh, uh, testing. And so, um, um, I, you know, everyone we talk to buys it. <laughs> Our penetration is good. But, uh, and, and mostly we sell through partners, by the way, um, the, the majority. So we, we love working with partners. But, but uh, um, look, I think that... Uh, um, 
you're going to see over the next several years that this is the only way to get the kind of coverage you want because no one's going to let you hire another hundred people per application to get the coverage that people want in the shorter time. Because one thing happened, here's the interesting thing, you can do this math. Let's say you used to have, you know, four weeks to do testing and now you've got four hours. All right, so you've got to cut the time by 90%, let's say, and um, it, you know, and they want the code coverage to go from 10% to 90%. So basically, you've got to improve the productivity of the team, you know, by something like 100 to 200 x. Yeah, right, you have no choice. You got to improve the team, the productivity of the team by 100 x. How are you going to do that without technology like this? It's not, it's not possible, right? You got to do it with technology. You got to do it with partners. You have no choice. That's one way to look at it. And everybody's driven for shorter turn times because people want to get a release out four times a day all of a sudden and higher coverage and the applications get more complex. Oh, great. Um, one question. Uh, how, how well does it integrate with your traditional test management systems as far as you know, uh, reporting results, bug tracking, et cetera? Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. I, we didn't show it. Obviously, uh, this is fully integrated with pretty much every CI tool out there, uh, fully integrated with Jira. It posts uh, uh, tickets to Jira automatically. It'll update those tickets. It'll clear the tickets. So all of that integration is there. Uh, it's, it, by the way, I think integration is table stakes today. I know there's people out there who go, look at our integration. How do you even play in QA without full sort of DevOps integration or agile integration? So we've had that for years. It's just table stakes. It's a given. And yes, excellent. Great question. Yeah, this I, I think this is a great question as well. Um, you know how how when you get into like FDA, uh, you know, highly regulated environments, medical device software. How AI friendly is that testing? I mean, to me, that does seem like there's there's probably going to be more of a human component there for the you know foreseeable future. But there are certainly ways that AI can make a big impact with those areas as well. Yeah, well, when you talk to talk about FDA, you've got medical devices uh, 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 that uh, the <laughs> it's complicated, right? People want to change the software on these devices or the access to the devices or whatever it is. And the FDA, you know, prior used to say you can't change anything, you know, without coming back to the FDA. And 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 of late, what we've seen is is the FDA willing to say, well. If you meet these criteria, you don't have to come back to us, but you have to test for that criteria every time. So that's a known set of criteria. That is better handled with something like Test Designer in a highly regulated, I wanna make sure you ran these 100 tests and you run the same 100 tests and get the same outcome every time. They're gonna be data driven, obviously, you're going to test edge cases and all the other things that the FDA requires. Um, the FDA doesn't care about code coverage. They don't even know what code coverage is. They just know these hundred things had better work the same on every build. That's sort of all they care about. So test designer, a killer way to do that if, you know, if you have a, a web interface and, uh, um, you know, AI is still going to get you great coverage, but the FDA doesn't really care as much. You may care, but the FDA cares less. Um, how do we handle a situation where we have multiple third-party systems that are used as part of the business flow and are necessary for test data setup? Yeah, sure. Um, it, it, it's, it's a great question, and that, that is common. You've got all kinds of global setups that we didn't go into today and conditionals, right? So conditionals can be put into AI, global setup, global teardown, things like that. So in the global setup, we see people go, you know, have a whole set of scripts that execute a certain set of things, then AI goes and does its thing, you know, to some interface or to multiple interfaces, and then you end later. Remember, you can also use validations for this. So you can get to a certain place and say, I want to jump out to this and do the following every time I get there. So you could get to a page and then literally talk SQL directly, the thing talks SQL directly or to an API and say, go interrogate this and make sure it's correct. So uh, all of the things that you could think of that today humans might do or very complex, you know, multi-app coordinated scripts do, you can do with this as well, both in test designer and, and in AI. But, but you really need a team or you need a team of people to step back and again say, what's right for test designer, because it's very powerful, and what's right for AI. I've had many clients uh, try to use AI the wrong way. Well, I don't know why it won't do that exact script. Well, if you want to do that exact script, just 
record it and test designer. That's why we have it. Don't try to make this machine over here do something that this piece does here. We have both for you for a reason. Uh, how, how, how can AI, an AI enabled strategy be adapted to a regulated environment? We talked a little bit about that, but where test to case creation needs to be traced and reviewed uh, very, very diligently, of course, through test and project management tools. Yeah, well, well, well again, um, you get to, you know, use test designer that, that is ML enabled, right? Um, AI is for uh, getting high coverage. And, uh, you know, today in our regulated environments, code coverage never comes up. It's not listed anywhere in, in most contracts. It doesn't say you must have tested 2A code coverage number greater than 90%. It doesn't say it. So, so here you've got this amazing thing that is right for the clients. It's right for the users, but the government doesn't understand what code coverage is. So it says, here are the 200 use cases our product manager or business analyst said you have to do, do those. Are they better done in test designer with ML assisted? Yes. Are, but your AI is going to get you coverage. They don't care about coverage in the contract, in, at least in most of the contracts I've seen. So while AI is going to help you deliver a far better product, your contract doesn't care. I, I, you know, oh well. <laughs> it's just, that's all I guess. But I would, I would certainly, you know, uh, uh, talk to Kirk about, uh, about utilizing test designer that, uh, that has all this self-healing capability, right? Because that is, uh, is ultimately going to save you about 80% in maintenance. Um, we had one question, of course, about uh, if the slides would be available after the webinar. We are recording this, so we'll be sending a link to the recording to everybody who has attended. So uh, definitely you'll, you'll get those. Um, Kevin, maybe, maybe really quick again, a, a kind of a, just a very brief overview on how AIQ does automated visual testing. Um, because you know a, a big component of QA, obviously, is just you know, more front-end testing, more UI testing. Uh, a quick example of that, if you would. Yeah, so, so technically, yes, it could do automated visual testing. That said, there are tools that out there that that's all they do. Apply Tools is an example. It's a popular one now, but there are a dozen or so. And um, all they do is say, here's what changed visually between this build and, 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 and that build. If that's all you want to do, you should incorporate that as part of your testing strategy. You should not try to make, I mean, yes, this will do it, but you shouldn't try to make this do that because that's a very specialized tool that just does visual comparison. Um, most of us, like on our website, we do visual comparison multiple times a day. Automatically, I think it costs us $19 a month to do that, right? It's about 12 times a day, about once an hour, and it goes and says, did anything change? And of course, sometimes we want it to change. The problem with visual comparison when you're doing new builds is, as you know, often in our applications, things move around a bit and we want them to. And all of a sudden you're flagging every single page and you're coming up. What this can do is much more insidious, if you will, or much more interesting. It can do comparisons to actions that are on pages. So normally our actions on pages should not change. So for example, if I get to a certain page and there are five things a user can do, I actually don't care if they move around the page, but I do care if they're no longer available right? That's what I care about. This system will do that automatically, fully through AI. You don't do anything. And it will, it will map them back and say, hey, there's something missing. The user used to have six options. There's only five. And it'll flag that to you. That's valuable. By the way, I didn't write a script to do that. The system does it automatically. Here's another thing it does. It can automatically compare between builds um, the set of API requests that come from every UI action. Every UI action throughout the application makes a set of API requests, often 100 or 200 or whatever it is. And isn't it interesting that we've never been able to see, are they different between builds? And they shouldn't be unless I changed my API. So if I didn't change my API spec, they better be the same. There should be an empty report. Well, it turns out often there isn't an empty report. That is the UX, the client side code changed, and somehow it's making a different set of requests or not making as many requests or miss some requests, even though it should have made the same requests because the, the API spec is the same. So we will show you that automatically. Again, no scripts. No, I didn't write a script. It did it by itself. That's the sort of the power of this. Um, 
does the system work against cross tech products such as uh, desktop and web based? I mean, is there you know is there a remarkable you know any kind of difference between the, uh, between yeah. doing testing on? Yeah, yeah. We, and, uh, you know, we support some limited desktop testing. For the most part, AI and Test Designer are not designed for desktop thick clients. Yes, we know there's people out there with still with desktop thick clients. The truth is hardly anyone's building new ones, right? They're still maintaining the old ones. So we have not spent any time um, refocusing on that technology. It's really web and mobile, which has been obviously all the growth over the last decade or so. Okay. Um, how do you check all the different scenarios that AIQ has created. Uh, I, I imagine you don't have to manually check each script. Uh, I assume, is there like a, a reporting capability that Test Designer has that says, here's all the scripts that you've made? Yeah, so the answer is, <clears throat> let's say the system went off and, 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 and wrote 5,000 scripts that are AI generated. You have to now as a QA person step back and say, um, I have to trust that the system got the uh, coverage that it says it got. Yes, you can interrogate all 5,000. You can open them up one by one. You can even edit them and rerun them. You can do anything you want. Every time it finds a bug, it'll hand you the script that, that caused the bug, right? So yes, you have that ability, but you've got 5,000 scripts. Even, yes, you can open them all, but even so, after script 10, you're gonna forget what they all do. How, how are you ever gonna make any, any sense of this, right? It's a little bit like you know getting in a driverless vehicle and saying, I'd like to look at the code that is making a decision whether uh, the system should turn right or left or, 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 or hit the uh, old lady crossing the road, right? Um, you could look at the code potentially if you knew the people, but what would you do with it anyway? So yes, we give it to you. Yes, they're in a folder. Yes, you can look at them. But when you're talking about the law of numbers here, the law of numbers starts to work for us in ways we never had. And let me tell you why. When we write 80 scripts, we know what all 80 do. Well, we wrote 80. When we write 5,000, probably no one person can know what all 5,000 did, even when the QA team wrote 5,000, right? There are people who will specialize in certain areas, but you can still pick one up and run it and see it. But there's no way to grok what 5,000 do. So let the law of numbers work for you and get you the coverage. Don't worry, did it do this or did it do that? But if you want to find out there's 5,000 in there, yeah. Yes. Have the ball. Well, Kevin, I know we're we're just a couple of minutes over the hour here, and uh, still have uh, a number of folks who are still on board. And thank you again. I mean, we'll probably wrap up in about five minutes. Uh, so, if you have any last second questions about AIQ or about the AI enabled strategy, please let us know. Uh, I think the bigger thing is we'd love to talk to you after the presentation as well, as you've seen our uh, contact info here. I mean, feel free to take a screenshot of that and reach out to us here at TAPQA uh, via my email address or a Calendly link. And we had a number of people who have already said, yes, definitely interested in doing a demonstration. Uh, Kevin, um, maybe a quick kind of overview of the demonstration. I mean, it's just more of, uh, you know, learning about one's environment and then just, you know, kind of getting in a little bit deeper with AIQ and how uh, we could implement it in their environment. Yeah, look, look, I, I think as always, every, one in the enterprise has their own pain points. Their, their pain points might be they need more staff, they need more time, they need more understanding, <laughs> you know, they can't find bugs fast enough, whatever it is, right? And, and they have that across one, two, 10, 100, sometimes thousands of applications. The best thing we can do, and, and you, know, you see the uh, conversation scheduler on there, the Calendly link, best thing you can do is actually um, you know, type out that link because you can't click on it on the video, I think. And, um, and get on Kirk's calendar and start to have a conversation. Uh, you know, he'll bring us in. We're happy to, 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 to see if there's a match. If there isn't, we're also happy to tell you that uh, together. But, uh, but if we can solve some of your pain points or some of your problems, uh, great. That's what we're here to do. We want to empower you. We want to take your QA team to, to the next level. Uh, you've probably been at whatever level you've been at for a long time doing about the same thing for probably 15 or 20 years. There, there is new technology for the last several years. You know, and like I, like I say in some of my uh, presentations with large audiences, I say, you know, there's a, there's a train that's leaving the station or has left the station, right? And, and you can, you know, either be in the front of the train, the middle of the train, or the end of the train. The same is true with a parade. The parade's going by. Do you want to lead the parade? 
Do I get in the middle? Do you want to be on the end? Well, as a QA professional, you never want to be in the end of the parade. You don't want to be the last person to know how this stuff works. You want to be the first. Because when you're the first, um, you know, everybody wants to talk to you and everybody wants to work with you, everyone within your company and probably everyone outside your company. So, you know, I always recommend get in front of the parade. Don't don't be last. One question, um, you know, kind of almost pertaining to this is, uh, you know, as we've talked about AIQ, um, you know, is there an approach or, you know, what what's the approach with, uh, you know, pointing AI or applying AIQ in certain areas, and then, um, you know, are there other platforms then to, uh, you know, tackle other areas? I mean, those are all parts of the, uh, you know, the AI, really the strategy that we're proposing is just, you know, kind of, uh, I think the meeting with us, uh, you know, we'll really look into, uh, you know, kind of overall what your organization tests, and then figuring out here's the compartment of the things that we'll put, uh, that we can definitely apply to AIQ to today, S take this big chunk of work off of your plate, and then really allow us to focus on the things that we need to do as humans or apply another platform to. So uh, that was one of, one of the comments that was in the chat room, just, you know, about that, uh, you know, hopefully that, you know, that answers that. It's definitely going to be, you know, different for every organization. Um, and that's why, you know, I think just, you know, sitting down with us, being able to really do that mapping. And then, uh, you know, again, applying the power of AIQ to, uh, to your, your specific organization. Yeah, I think I think one way uh, you know you can look at it from from uh, the, the the client's perspective, uh, QA engineer's perspective is: Do I want to find more bugs in less time that are more important with the team I have? With the team I have, your team's not going anywhere. The team you have is the team you have. But do you want to or need to find more bugs that are more important and have a strategy around which of those are more important and drive that back to depth? Do you want to do that? Do you need to do that? If you need to do that you know, you need to be technology enabled better than the technology you have. Because if the technology you have is working perfectly, then you wouldn't need to find more bugs faster. You'd be done. You, you shouldn't be on the webinar, right? You wasted an hour. So, so I hope you didn't waste your hour. No, oh, thanks, Kevin. Um, well, I think we're, uh, you know, we, we've wrapped up with questions. So again, wanted to thank everybody, uh, you know, on behalf of uh, all of us here at TAP QA. Uh, and Mike and Colin, uh, definitely uh, wishing you the best and hoping everything is going well, uh, given everything going on in the world and hope that you and your loved ones are uh, safe and healthy. And, and again, a big thanks to you, Kevin, for uh, being a part of this webinar here today. Happy to do it. Uh, great partnership. Uh, hope we can all uh, uh, meet everybody who was on the webinar. Uh, click the Calendly link or type it in or whatever you do. Thanks so much, everybody. Yeah, thanks. And uh, again, for anyone that has questions afterwards, uh, you know, feel free to address those to us and uh, look forward to speaking with many of you. So thanks again. And I um, hope you have a great rest of the day.